Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome, uh, warm, warmly welcome our special guest, Professor Maciej Górny, and I invite you, all of you, to listen to his uh, lecture entitled To Arms, Great War is Central Europe, Human Science. First of all, I'd like to express my gratitude. It's great to be here, and, well, it's... Uh, it's been my alma mater, and I always feel like uh, allowed to uh, to visit it. Um, the story I'm going to um, to tell today is an exercise in, let's say, uh, blurring divides. Uh, this between science and rubbish, and that between Western and East Central Europe. Um, I've been operating, so to say, within this space for the last 20 years or so. On the beginning of which there is Jerzy uh, Litsky slightly reluctantly accepting me as a member of his uh, unit at the Academy of Sciences. So you see that it's a particular honor for me to speak at a conference set to commemorate the memory of this particular an extraordinary man and scholar. Besides, uh, as I suspect, that is the reason of inviting me here. Uh, the other uh, might be uh, a book uh, which I should have taken with me, but I, sorry, I, I just, just forgot it, um, which is devoted to um, to uh, Eastern Europe's intellectuals and, uh, well, I'll say broadly understood First World War. Slightly prior to the outbreak of the war and uh, of years afterwards, after, after its uh, end. Mm. What I'm going to say today is more or less based on my previous studies, uh, including this book. Uh, but I will make it concise and much cheaper than, uh, than it is in this printed version, which is unbearably expensive. Um, well, historians dealing with intellectuals in the Great War devote most of their attention to statements made by them in the early months of the conflict. That is, in a way, understandable given the stature of figures such as Emile Durkheim, uh, Henri Bergson, Gerhard Hauptmann, or Thomas Mann, all of them uh, speaking aloud about the meaning of war, about the character of the enemy, and about inner reasons for our own nation to, to participate. Mm. The War of the Spirits, Krieg der Geister, uh, as it had been called back in 1914 and 1918 and later, uh, began, however, uh, to dissipate in the West uh, after more or less two years of fighting, that is roughly 1916. The Eastern, war, or the Eastern Front of, of the Great War tells yet another story, much more interesting. Uh, and satire also to say. In my presentation I will briefly tell the story of East Central and Southeastern Europe, uh, regularities and particularities of this phenomenon. As you will see, uh, the bulk of such writings of intellectuals from the region subscribe to a particular tradition of uh, national characterology, which is a vague term naturally. Uh, I would I would characterize it perhaps as something wider than ethnopsychology. In most general terms, characterology refers to general psychological traits of a certain ethnic or social group, a generalization, as I believe, uh, not totally alien to historians of anti-Semitism. Mm. Speaking of, uh, speaking of the other element of my speech, that is science, 
I will then shortly refer to the interferences between this characterology and such disciplines as geography, uh, anthropology, and uh, psychiatry, psychology. Uh, well, the beginnings, roughly 1914, were not particularly uh, regionally specific. Just as in the West, most authors employed in magazines uh, involved in the so-called War of Spirits were intellectuals and men of culture. Interestingly, the early publications uh, more often than not ignored uh, their special regional uh, history, special regional realities, focusing, for example, on uh, German atrocities in Belgium instead of similar acts of brutality in, in the Kingdom of Poland, notably in uh, Kalisz. Uh, soon, unstable political situation uh, placed uh, some of those authors in both warring camps. Such was the case with uh, Vincent Zimowski, uh, an important person for uh, uh, Polish history afterwards. In early 1915, Zimowski pub published a pamphlet entitled Podboje Rossi, that is Russia's Conquests, uh, which described the internal consolidation of the empire in the face of the war. When Germans occupied the Kingdom of Poland in 1915, Zimowski was uh, shortly interned in a prison of war camp. A year later, following his release, he gave a public lecture in which he shared his camp experience. Uh, and if you read this text, it goes precisely along the same lines as German wartime intellectual propaganda. He, what he does is uh, krieg der Geister, uh, well, even more than 100%. Uh, what uh, Zemowski has to say is uh, that Germany and its allies in Central Europe are faced by a, uh, I quote it, now a uh, procession of countless tribes and peoples uh, serving England often uh, against their best wishes and against their interest. The French, on the other hand, again much alike in the works of German intellectuals like uh, Thomas Mann, uh, were plagued by a desire uh, for revenge. Uh, for its erstwhile eulogist, Russia ended up on the worst side of the deal, and that is an element which seems uh, regionally par a regional particularity for me, for my eyes. I quote now from Zemowski, in a prisoner of war camp, the Russian is a born proletarian, pauper uh, by nature and habit given to offering himself a servant to any power and for any reward. While the Frenchman consumes the abundant provisions and delicacies, the Muscovite stands behind his seat with that lowly band in his neck, a timeless mark of congenital slavery." End quote. Zemowski was not alone in shifting to his allegiances. Starting with 1915, the uh, entire region gradually fell under German and Austro-Hungarian occupation, which contributed massively to the extent ideological current of support for central powers. Quite naturally, the German and Austro-Hungarian propaganda motives permitted local production, yet already at this early stage, there was an individual touch to it. Uh, first of all, England and France bashing did not sell well in the East. Secondly, some of the local authors seemed even more critical towards Russia than the toughest of the German language authors. Whereas even deep into the war, the latter continued to restrict their criticism to the Russian elite, somehow redeeming the, right, the bright picture of the Russian folk, Poles, Lithuanians, Jews, and Ukrainians stressed the universality of Russian ethno-psychological pathologies. To give an example, Stanisław Przybyszewski, Polish poet and writer, expounded broadly on the difference between the Polish and Russian psychological type. I quote now, uh, on the one hand, an astounding liveliness, endeavor, adaptability, and near rapacious possessiveness in the spiritual. On the other, passivity, stone-like languor, Asiatic conservatism. End quote. Dmitro Donsov, 
the future ideologies of Ukrainian integral nationalism, but at this particular moment still a socialist, used almost identical terms to describe the characterological distinctions between Russians and Ukrainians. I quote, on the one hand, activity of a society conscious of its rights, endowed with undaunted powers of, on the other, languorousness, absence of a spirit of protest, oriental, almost Asiatic humility towards all authority, end quote. Both authors believed that Western civilization imparted on Russia failed to take root, and that the country's civilization is mere pretense. In symbolic terms, Poles and Ukrainians expressed this view by substituting the words Russians with Muscovites. You noticed this probably in these quotations. Uh, from there, an open road led to transportations of characterological observations into the realm of racial anthropology, uh, more or less along the lines that, uh, you know, uh, starting with uh, the usage of the words Moscovitz, uh, they arrived at the theory of a non-Slavic origin of Russians, uh, which is the name, uh, that is Russians, which is the only Slavic element of this ethnic, uh, of this ethnic substance. There is nothing Slavic about Russia, it is basically an Asiatic, uh, Asiatic Asiatic population, a mix of various uh, nationalities, uh, Mordvins, uh, Chukchas, and whatever, uh, with a, a slightly layer of Slavic uh, civilization on it, and with a stolen name, which uh, rightly belongs to the Ukrainian culture. Mitro Donsov, or by uh, the great historian Mihail Wohrushevsky. Um, another particularity of this region were the spatial and temporal dimension of the intellectual conflict. As time went by, the warring powers and the minor allies were joined in their struggle by newly established political organizations, uh, usurping the right to represent particular nationalities of Central and Eastern Europe. East of Germany, war did not begin in 1914, nor did it end in 1918. Neither were the front lines of War of the Spirits in the East concurrent with the boundaries between warring states, a feature typical of war in the West. Indeed, as a rule, these lines crisscrossed the territories of major powers with the intellectual conflict often occurring uh, actually outside of actual military operations. At times, the Eastern War of the Spirits saw allies engage in conflict with one another. A relentless enmity reflected in an abundance of wartime literary productions divided Polish and Ukrainian political activists, while the Polish-Lithuanian conflict also intensified. Though censorship, particularly active in Congress Poland under German occupation, hashed down excessively caustic statements, there can be no doubt that the mutual aversion of Poles and Germans hardly abated throughout the war years, similarly to the Czechs and Germans. Uh, and so on and so on. Broken down into a myriad of minor sections, the Eastern Front of War of the Spirits proved by and large to anticipate the post-war situation in the region. Among the few ideological front lines which corresponded to actual uh, battlefronts was that between Serbia and Bulgaria. In Bulgarian uh, wartime intellectual propaganda, Serbians were consistently cast as the antagonists branded as chauvinistic, primitive, and backward megalomaniacs. This stereotype was framed by the contrast between a uh, actually, uh, actually yes, a growingly literate Bulgaria and Serbia continually struggling with illiteracy. Already in 1913, Bulgarian propaganda attached this distinction to the opposition between civilization and barbarity. So basically, if you search for uh, this uh, conflict between uh, culture and civilization or uh, on, on the other front, the Eastern front between Germany and Russia, so between civilization and barbarianism, uh, you find it 1912, 1913 in the Balkans already uh, more or less arrive. Um, Bulgarian psychological disposition also earned commendations from German, Hungarian, and Austrian authors who conferred the Bulgarians' primacy among all Balkan uh, peoples. Uh, 
as Adolf Strauss, ethnographer from Budapest, noted, their virtu virtues were too conspicuous to accept their subjugation by the less worthy, as he formulated this, uh, Serbians and Romanians. Alexander Redlich uh, claimed that um, while uh, there was not a, there was not a pure barbarity, uh, neither did they possess a fully formed culture. A typical Serb was a mixture of the two. His education, I quote now, his education has not yet concluded. He might yet become a worthy member of the European cultural universe. Thus far, though, a solid pressure needs to be applied to prevent him from terrorizing Europe." End quote. By comparison, Bulgarians excelled in maturity, courage, patriotism, and intelligence. This set of virtues invited comparisons with uh, Bulgarians, regularly likened to Prussians. Still, the term Prussians of the Balkans, applied at the time, repeatedly uh, used uh, to describe Bulgarians, was not sufficiently unambiguous. In the eyes of authors within the town, it figured as an accusation rather than a compliment. I quote now from uh, Robert Seton Watson, the ideals which inspire Prussia and Bulgaria today are identical. Arrogant contempt of other peoples, ruthless efficiency, ruthless Bulgarian efficiency, uh, and the worship of material progress, end quote. Similar equivocations resulted from the identification of national attributes with the figure of a typical peaceful and persistent Bulgarian peasant. Serbian uh, geographer, the best Serbian geographer ever, Jovan Svic, used this motive as a proof that Bulgarians were characterized by an absence of energy, will to fight, and slavish submission to their masters already under the Turkish yoke. He ascribed to Bulgarians attributes that resemble those many Polish and Ukrainian authors attributed to Russians. Thus, Bulgarians were branded with Asiatic passivity, as their affinity to the West was represented as less significant than that of the more Western Serbians. The heroism of Serbian soldiers won them the warmest affection of many observers. Following on the heel of international aid and expressions of support, were characterological conclusions often setting the image of the noble Serbian against that of a Bulgarian. While Bulgarians were referred to as Prussians of the Balkans, some British and French authors believed that Serbians merited the name of the Frenchmen of the Balkans. Similar competition in the field of national character could be observed between Poles and Ukrainians, with Germany playing the, for most of the time uh, the role of a jury before this role was reclaimed by the victorious powers. Many of such peregrinations into the, uh, into the uh, realm of the national character uh, bordered on some kind of scientific evidence. Jovan Svic, for example, uh, based his territorial claims on arguments taken from ethnology, including folk songs. Uh, to his mind, even though the Macedonian language has some resemblance uh, to the Bulgarian folk songs and customs point at closeness to Serbia. Even more strikingly, uh, according to both uh, Jovan Svic and uh, another uh, geographer and anthropologist, Niko Županic, of whom I will speak uh, some more uh, later, uh, the same could be in principle claimed even about Albanians. In the field of uh, geography, scholars such as Eugeniusz Romer, uh, Stepan Rodnicki, uh, Jovan Svic, Viktor Dvorsky, a Czech geographer, Simeon Mehedinci, a great Romanian geographer, uh, and many others defined a new, a national space inscribed into the minds of the inhabitants, or to make things even more versatile in the characteristics of the landscape, in arts of trees or ge geological features of the country. All this could speak nation. Some, as Karel Domin, a Czech biologist, did come to a conclusion that certain types of plants simply correspond to a certain nation. In his particular in case, the beech trees, which uh, mark the realm of the Czechs. Many times, the war of the spirits seemed to take a different path from the model described so far by reversing the logical 
or illogical, if you like, order. Instead of utilizing science for characterology, some authors added elements of the latter into full-fledged science. Psychiatry offers extremely interesting examples of such a reasoning. The idea of a correlation between national background and susceptibility to particular mental disorders attracted the attention of the Viennese physician Alexander Pilch. In his post-war publications, Pilch rejected the claim that any given race was more susceptible than others to psychological diseases in general. But the specifics of his findings varied from one group of his studies to the next and demonstrated predispositions to different kinds of illness. In May 1919, Pilch presented the results of his work at a meeting uh, of the Viennese Anthropological Society. Having studied almost 12,000 soldiers, he concluded that Germans suffered more than others from depression and alcohol-induced psychosis, with Poles and Czechs equaling, equaling them in the latter. Uh, meanwhile, alcohol-induced psychosis rarely affected Southern Slavs, Italians, um, or Hungarians. Jews did not suffer from them at all. Instead, they suffered from hysteria and various kinds of psychosis resulting from hereditary degeneration. Italians and Southern Slavs topped the charts for epilepsy. Hungarians uh, proved highly prone to ascending paralysis. In general, Pilch found particular tendencies to hypochondria among Jews, to depression among Germans, and to stupor and catatonia among Slavs. The discussion, that is interesting, the discussion that followed Pilch's uh, presentation shows the near impossibility of the time, of the time of debating these issues without succumbing to the temptation to create hierarchies of nationality. Aside from the speaker, uh, there were three other active participants in this uh, discussion. The first, Rudolf Puch, leader of the wartime research into the racial makeup of the Russian prisoners of war, uh, summed up uh, Pilch's claims much less ambiguously than he himself had, stating that the presentation furnished telltale proof of psychiatric distinctions between the races. Another participant, uh, Robert Stigler, uh, author of Racial Studies of the Ugandans, departed even further, proposing that the particularly high incidence of psychic disorders among Jews resulted from their psychic similarity to women. That must have been surprising to Pilch. Um, Pilch, and basically, uh, you, you don't know it, but it's, it's, an, it's a footnote now, uh, he will lose his university position in 1938 due to his Jewish background basically. Not a woman, but still a Jew. Uh, Pilch did not respond to this claim. Uh, instead, he merely affirmed that Jews were likely to have significantly representation among victims of sexual psychosis. Last person to speak, Arthur Haberland, a participant in the Austro-Hungarian ethnographic exploration of the Balkans during the war, suggested that psychiatry, with its idea of mass suggestion, might prove capable of explaining the mass desertions of Czech soldiers. Despite his attempt to be objective, as you see, Pilch's report collided with the scholarly community's deep-seated beliefs in racial psychology and national character. Uh, for, uh, for example, uh, in anthropological research heavily indebted to characterology, I will uh, use an example of a colleague uh, of Jovan Svic, a Slovene ethnologist and anthropologist Niko Županic. The year 1912 uh, saw so the reissue of, uh, in Vienna of a new edition of his work, which uh, justified Serbian claims to Albania. In the book, he criticized the nationalist, uh, nationalist exclusivism of French and German scientists who failed to reckon with the exceptional biological potential of some Balkan nationalities. Meanwhile, Serbs, as he claimed, retained an untainted primordial Aryan Slavic character, especially in the south of the country, that is, light-colored skin and hair, blue or gray eyes, dolichocephaly, that is, long skull, allegedly typical of the Indo-Germanics, and large stature. 
uh, of the Slavic Albanian border, the Nordic component combined with remnants of the Illyrian Romanized primordial population. As a result, now I quote from uh, Županic, the mixing of Serbian and Illyrian blood produced one of the most elevated anthropological alloys in Europe, the so-called Dinaric or Adriatic race. This race is characterized by a tall, slender, almost never stout, built, dark colored eyes and hair, and a rounded skull, perhaps slightly flattened at the back. Uh, Hawk-like eyes throw sparks <laughs> sorry, and testify to a gallant heart. Uh, these people are full of zest and energy with very lively facial features. In his post-war works uh, devoted to the ethnogenesis of the Yugoslavs, Županic reiterated uh, his uh, m metaphors, claiming that in the case of Serbs, racial mixing had produced formidable results. I quote again, even precious, precious gold is not most valuable or durable when found in its pure state. For this reason, it in mints, it is alloyed with copper and other less valuable metals in order to increase its hardness, vividness, and beautiful sheen. The romantic notion of a national character could easily get into close contact with scientific concepts of psychopathology and equally likely with the Nordic theory. Entanglements between both sides of such transfers Anglements between both sides uh, of uh, such transfer act actually benefited everyone. Uh, science delivered allegedly hard proof to vague theories, giving the authors opportunity to reiterate to numbers, skulls, and measures. On the other hand, national character proved to be something people would like to learn about, to an extent that even dull rows of biometric data acquired national sense. This was particularly clear in the words of another wartime scientist, a great, again, a great Ukrainian geographer, Stepan Rudnitsky, um, commenting upon an unusually spare table that is really three rows of numbers uh, containing basic statistical data on the psychic, physical features of Poles, Ukraine, and Russia. Three rows, more or less. 24 numbers, I guess, without uh, totally irrelevant numbers, believe me, really have no meaning. Uh, but for Rudnitsky, who claimed, these three rows of numbers acquired through the application of exact and natural sciences tell us more than any thick volume would. These few numbers prove in the plainest possible manner that we Ukrainians are an independent nation. Neither Polonized Moscovites nor Russified Poles, but a nation that is also independent in its racial makeup. A statement that could not be made with respect to either Poles or Moscovites." End quote. Well, to sum up uh, all this, uh, there seem to be to my eyes, no sufficient causes for treating East Central Europe as an exceptional front of the war of the spirits, neither in intellectual standing uh, of the authors involved, all of the quoted authors are uh, first rank intellectuals, uh, the guys who uh, invented things, who founded first scientific journals in their disciplines, who were first professors and whom we celebrate until today. Nor in the discursive strategies they used did it deviate from its counterpart on the Western Front. For every Durkheim or Bergson, there is some Przybyszewski or Hrushevsky in the East of Europe. This necessitates uh, a revision in the chronology of the European conflict, a change which is otherwise congruent with the recent tendency in First World War history. What British and French intellectuals perceived as a passing phase became a chronic problem in Germany and countries farther to the east. What seems more important, though, is the strength of another subdivision of the War of the Spirits in the east and southeast of Europe. What I mean is human science, anthropogeography, psychiatry, anthropology, ethnology, etc. 
contrary to the uh, regular intellectuals whose wartime engagement seems to have been a pause from their typical activities, more reasonable activities. Uh, scholars such as uh, Romer, Rudnitsky, or Zvij did not get crazy after 1914 and logically never turned back to normal afterwards. They possessed an ability to speak the words of war through their science. And many of them actually never ceased to fight.